Well, thank you so much for tuning in today to CA Church Online. My name is Andrew, one of the pastors here. And we're continuing our series this month of August in Encountering God. And one of the ways to encounter God is to make space for Him. And this is so important for us during this time to not fill our time with Netflix, different things, but actually make space to hear from God. We encounter God when we make space for Him and we wait on Him. So this whole month of August, we're going to be just creating space in different ways. Maybe it's going to be more scripture heavy, maybe just instrumentals and we can pray in our small groups or community groups. Or even if you're listening on the bus with headphones, our prayer is wherever you are, you encounter the living God as we wait and make space for him. And so a passage we're going to start with today comes from the book of Psalms and it's chapter 62. I'll read it for us. It's verse 5 to 8. It says this, My soul waits in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold, I will not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And so we're going to just create space today and just wait Come hungry for him and come expecting. Wherever you're watching, let's encounter the living God together. Would you 
show us your glory Come and move in power, Lord We're ready to encounter you, Lord Father, we thank you that when we call to you, when we cry to you for mercy, when we make space, thank you that you reveal yourself to us. We love you, Jesus. And I called, you answered, and you came to my rescue and I want to be where you We're going to read another passage of scripture together. Also comes from the book of Psalms. Marika, why don't you read it for us? So Psalm 6, 2 to 4 says this. It says, Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Let's declare it together. I called. I called. You answered. And you came to my rescue. And I want to be where you are. Where you are. I just want to be where you are. Maybe even just in this moment, wherever you're watching, again, if you're at home or if you're just watching on your phone with headphones on transit, this is a moment where you can encounter the living God. Let's just take a moment here. We'll just play and we'll spend time in God's presence here on this rooftop. But wherever you are, let's just take a moment and engage with God. Maybe pray in your home. Pray for one another. We just want to be where you are. One more passage of scripture together it comes from Psalms as well. Josh, why don't you read that for us? 
Psalm 16, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Keep me safe, my God, for on you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. So we're going to sing this chorus together. It's going to be new for us. But let's make it our prayer that there's no place we want to be but the feet of Jesus. Sweet communion. Sweet communion. There's no place I'd rather be than sitting at your feet, sweet communion. Sweet communion. Sweet communion. There's no place I'd rather be than sitting at your feet, sweet communion. So Jesus, today we just want to be at your feet. We just want to be present in your presence. We thank you that when we call on your name, you answer. And that we have this opportunity, this amazing opportunity to just be in your presence and to encounter you, the living God. And so in every area of our worship today, as we give our offering to you, we give it cheerfully and humbly and grateful. And it's a part of our worship. As we dive into your word and learn more about who you are, what you've done, I just pray that you continue to show us new glimpses of your power and your glory. We love you, Jesus, and we do all this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, music team, for leading us today. You're certainly most welcome. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my name's Sam, and this is Andrew, and we're so thrilled that you would join us today for our weekend service. Well, as you said, as you finish the worship set today, if people want to give, if they want to worship in that way, there's a variation of ways that you can do that. And so all the different ways you can give will be on the screen right now. Probably right around here. Or go to cachurch.info to do it. (laughs) Well, it's been so fun singing on the rooftop and singing in different places, but man, I miss singing with you in person. If you're a part of our mailing list, you'll see that Pastor Mark sent out a letter and a video just kind of walking through what it's going to look like for us moving forward as a church family this fall. Very exciting things happening. If you're not on that mailing list, go to our website, get connected so you're up to date with what's happening. But at the end of this month, we're going to be gathering officially in person. And of course, there's restrictions, different things. So check out the website for updates. But I am so excited. I'm so excited as well. Some of you have been gathering in homes through the season, and that's fantastic. But others haven't had an opportunity to do that, to gather with other Christians. And so this is going to open up just another space for you to get together as the body of Christ as we celebrate Jesus and the hope we have in Him. Another thing that I'm really excited about is this last week, one of my favorite Christian artists released a new single, Chris Tomlin. (laughs) I'm kidding. Andrew Marcus. I love Chris. Shout out, Chris. But in all honesty, Abide in Me is a great song. Many of you heard it a few weeks ago in our in our weekend service, and it actually came out this last week. And so why don't you just tell us a bit about the song? Well, I'm so excited. It's been a song that's really been ministering to my heart. And I wrote it last year, actually. Pastor John, John Hawes, our young adults pastor, uh, was reading through John 15 as we were praying every day for Holy Week uh, last Easter. And I was just so consumed with all the rehearsals and all the different things for Easter that I just got so overwhelmed by the tasks. And uh, I was just restless one night and I just grabbed my guitar and prayed to the Lord. And he just reminded me, and it's something that's been speaking to me even now during this pandemic, 
we're just encouraged to always be socially distant and all these different things and God's just reminding me and I hope he reminds you as you listen to the song that he's doing the opposite. He's actually drawing closer and closer and so I'm just excited and I pray that God, you know, hears, uh, everyone who hears the song uh, are just reminded of that truth that God is faithful and that he's close and he draws near. So go to Spotify or Apple Music or anywhere that you listen to music to check out Andrew's new song. And Chris Tomlin's. <laughs> Well, at this point, uh, we're excited that our friends Melanie and Rob Frares, yeah. who've been a huge part of our building campaign, are just going to give us a quick update of where we're at with the finances, yeah. as well as what we can look forward to in the next coming weeks uh, in our building. So check it out. Hello, CA Church family. We're here just outside the new building. As you can see, the large concrete walls have been tilted up, and the structural steel is currently going in to hold the building together. These include some of these large steel joists that create the different floors, the roof as well as the stairwells. They are almost done with the roof as they are finishing installing the metal decking on top of the roof structure. They are also working on backfilling, meaning pushing the dirt to fill in the areas dug up around the building. Financially, because of the generosity of our church, we're approaching $5 million raised. Although we're not currently in a fundraising campaign, we would love to be as close to debt free as possible and so you can still give towards the building project in this time. Thank you so much for your continued generosity towards the new building. That's all the announcements we have for today. Now we're going to hear a message from Pastor Brad Strelow. Hey everybody, welcome to my backyard. Guys, in the midst of my frustration with COVID, one of the gifts it has given me is the opportunity to do work in my yard uh, and, and work at cultivating a garden, something I, I was never really into before. In fact, I've, I've probably done more work in my garden in the last four months than I have in the last 10 years. You can ask my family, they will, they will tell you that's true. Uh, the majority of my garden is what's called a perennial garden and some of you guys, know what a perennial garden is. There's something very gospel-like in a perennial garden because each year, even though it appears that the plants are gone, they're, they're dead, they're buried, they emerge every spring with new life. There's hope in a perennial garden because each year, no matter how much it looks like the story is one of, of death and decay, new life is promised and received every year. Now, the person who taught me about gardens was my father-in-law, Goodmund. He spent more time in my garden than, than I did. Often I would come home from work and find him clipping things and taking care of things. The very fact I even know what a perennial garden is and have a clue of how to go about dealing with a garden is because of his love for gardens and, and much of the wisdom that he passed on to my wife and I. Now, those of you who know the family, you know uh, that uh, we said our final goodbyes to Goodman on July 21st at 1.53 p.m. after his, his fight with cancer. And I was privileged, not just as a son-in-law, but also as Goody's pastor, to pray with him, sing songs, read scripture, uh, watch some recorded sermons on his TV, which brought him comfort. It was hard to watch him suffer. It was hard for the entire family to want to take his pain away. And, and it was and is hard now to, to say goodbye to him. But even in his passing, I'm reminded, and I, I will be every time I tend a garden, this garden, that there is hope for those who are in Christ Jesus. This was the ongoing proclamation of, of, from Goody's lips. He, Goody was not a perfect man, but he knew where his hope lied, that, that the story is not over when the flowers fall and hope appears over. There is, there is something at work behind the scenes. For Christians, this, this is the great promise. This is the great hope that we each have. For many of you, these are tough times, times of, of anger and, and uncertainty, and for many, fear and hopelessness. And if we're, we're not careful, we can find ourselves following and in embracing disheartened and dispirited lives rather than the hope that we have been offered by a God of hope, who through the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the humble King offers us hope in any circumstance. Not a, not a delivery from every circumstance, not a delivery from every difficulty, but hope in the midst of difficulty. 
So that even in our suffering, our fear, even as we as a family mourn loss, we can echo the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, that we do not mourn as those without hope. So guys, today I want to talk to you a little about the kind of faith that brings hope, that sustains us. Vincent Donovan was a, a Catholic priest and a, and a missionary in Tanzania. And while well in Tanzania, he was working to translate the Bible into the language of the Maasai in Africa. And in one of his books, Donovan records a conversation with a Maasai elder about the word for faith and the word that should be used in their translation. The elder explained that the word chosen by Donovan and his translators was, was, wasn't good enough. It was insufficient. It, 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 it didn't do the trick. It wasn't powerful enough because the word that Donovan chose for faith, it simply meant to agree to something. There was no power behind it. And this elder said, faith is much stronger than that. He said the word chosen was similar to a white hunter shooting an animal with his gun from a great distance. Only his eyes and his fingers took part in the act. In the act. Donovan needed to find another word. The elder explained it this way. He said, for a man really to believe is like a lion going after its prey. His nose and eyes and ears pick up the prey. His legs give him the speed to catch it. All the power of his body is involved in the terrible death leap and single blow to the neck with the front paw, the blow that actually kills. And as the animal goes down, the lion envelops it in his front legs, pulls it to himself and makes it part of himself. This is the way the lion kills. This is what faith is. Whew. Quite colorful. <laughs> and an all-engulfing taking on of the faith, getting it in our sights, chasing it, working at it, and then fully consuming it and allowing it to satisfy our hunger and be what actually sustains us. See, if we see, if we see faith as something we simply agree to, a list of orthodox statements that we check off, faith can become very stale and not produce much hope in us. See, but faith that sees in Christ our, our sustenance and our fullest hope is the kind that, that, that grabs a hold of the gospel and never lets go. W would that describe our faith, your faith, my faith? An all-consuming, sustaining hope? Or is it something we would rather observe from a distance? See, this kind of faith can only come from the hope that, it, that is in us, the hope of glory, all, all the blessings caught up in the person of Christ, which are ours because we are his. In one of his letters to a, a small first, first century church in a small first century town called Colossae, uh, which needed a sustaining hope, a hope that would endure through hardship and fear, the Apostle Paul wrote these words in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. He says, we, the, the, the people that were doing missions with him, writing this letter, we always pray for you. We, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope in what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. So you and I live in a world that pushes fear like a drug that is consumed and embraced in the same way this Messiah elder says we ought to consume and embrace the good news of Jesus. Paul's answer to fear, in fact, the answer to fear for every Christian is to wholly embrace Christ. Paul writes elsewhere in his letter to, to the Christians in Rome, you know, in a, who were also facing a time when, when persecution of Christians was the norm, murder, rejection, death. He writes this in Romans 8, 38 to 39. He says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, listen, do you, do you want an enduring strength that endures through the deepest difficulty? It's not, it's not mustered up. It's not, it's not found in, in looking within. It's, it's found in the person and work of God through Jesus Christ. The object of our hope will determine the strength of our faith. The object of our hope will determine the strength of our faith. 
And we see this in the lives of more modern day heroes as well, who faced difficulty and fear. It isn't a belief in self, it is a belief in something deeper and eternal, an eternal hope. Martin Luther King Jr., he had a dream for the South, for the entire USA, for the, for the world. But his dream was a divine dream fueled by hope. Hope of a future where there would be equality. And it was based on something bigger than just what he could accomplish. Mother Teresa's work in the slums of Calcutta was based on a divine humility built on hope. Hope of a, a coming justice that she hoped in and for, whether she saw it come to fruition or not. William, Wilber William Wilberforce's fight to end slavery in the 18th and 19th century, it was a divine fight based on hope. Hope of seeing the eternal reality of God's kingdom become an earthly one. Your hope today, my hope today, in the middle of whatever this service is distracting you from for a few minutes, whatever you're going to have to face again on Monday, your hope in the midst of COVID, your hope in the midst of racial tension, even in the midst of sickness and death, your hope, my hopes, are ill-fitted to us as Christ followers if they do not look beyond a political solution, a political leader, or a hashtag to the, the promises offered you and I through the cross and resurrection and the eternal kingship of Jesus Christ. A confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven, Paul says. That is where enduring faith and hope come from. So later in the same chapter... Paul continues to talk about the, the kinds of prayers he has for this church in Colossae. He says in verse 11, We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So how do we find hope in what seems like hopeless times? Well, what's been your default? What, what truth do you cling to when the unforeseen comes? The truth Paul tells us to cling to is our rescue, our, our transfer from death to life and all that that means. Why? Because it's an enduring truth. It's a forever truth. Unlike every other truth you or I might try to build our lives on. Money, beauty, accomplishment, romance, literally every other pursuit will have an end point, but not Jesus, not the truth of his kingdom, not the truth of the gospel. That's why the apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The promises of the Lord remain forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. That's why the greatest tool in strengthening us in the middle of trial is to revisit and revisit the truth of the gospel over and over and over. Preach the gospel to each other as a church and to ourselves. Jesus' prayer in John 17, 17, praying to God the Father, speaking of his church, says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them, engage them. A loose association with God, a loose association with Jesus as a distant Savior does not give us hope. The Messiah elder had it right. Faith is not a simple belief or an agreement. It is a wholehearted throwing oneself at Jesus, of finding our sustenance in him and allowing his life to animate ours. And that's the kicker. Does our hope in Jesus animate us? Does it take us over? Does it well up from, from inside us? Paul says in verse 10 that the, the knowledge of this eternal hope will cause us to always honor and please the Lord and, and produce lives with, with every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better, continuing to dive in, knowing God more and more. The more we consume this truth, the more this truth consumes us. The more we revisit this truth and, and learn to know God better and better, the more we are animated to honor and please God, to be spiritually fruitful in, in a fashion that cannot be contained. Have you met those kinds of Christians? <laughs> they talk about their engagement with people and, and the gospel, that they have this kind of faith that cannot be contained. One of the consistent historical complaints of society against the church is that the gospel will not be contained, that Christians won't shut up. It was, it's the story in the book of Acts, and it's the continued story throughout history. Christians have this annoying urge to bring their conviction of hope to the public. Christians always think that Jesus ought to have a say in everything. 
Now, why do Christians always have to declare that God is doing something and that people should get in on it? And maybe you've wondered that. Why is, why is that such an important aspect of the gospel that when people become Christians, they then want to let other people know? Well, here's why. Because the, the roof has been ripped open on the cosmos. Paul makes it clear in, in this letter to, to the Colossians and, and elsewhere that the history of the world space and time has no choice but to go in the direction that God has ordained and proclaimed it to go. So to proclaim to the world that Jesus is king of creation is to give a heads up to where history is headed. Because as Paul writes elsewhere in Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow one day and every tongue will confess one day that Jesus Christ is Lord. And our opinion won't matter too much at that point. It will happen. That is the trajectory of history. Many kingdoms have come and gone. Many mighty rulers have made great boasts. Even in Jesus' day, people like Herod and Caesar making massive claims, building massive buildings and structures so that that the world would know and never forget about them. But no kingdom has had the staying power of the church, of those who find themselves in the kingdom of light, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light with an eternal hope. A few years ago, I was homeschooling my daughter and we were looking at some some poetry. And uh, I've done I've looked at more poetry homeschooling my daughter than I've ever looked at in my life. Uh, We came across a poem called Ozymandias by Piercy Shelley. It's it describes a a broken statue of a legendary king of uh, of ancient times. And the statue is lying forgotten in the desert with these words carved on its base, the only remaining standing part. It says, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look at my works, ye mighty, and despair. And Shelley was writing about a statue of Ramses II of Egypt. Now the irony is not lost on anyone who takes in the image that he paints with his words. When one looks around to take in the mighty works of Ramses, all they see are ruins and sand. Shelley writes, nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Shelley paints a beautiful picture of the kingdoms of the world and the pursuits of the world. And to to this small church in Colossae, Paul is saying, "You, you may belong to a small town with a small congregation, but you hope in something that surpasses all that. If you belong to Christ, you are on the right side of history, it doesn't, smell, doesn't, doesn't matter how small or insignificant you may feel, how persecuted you may feel, how alone you may feel. Oh man, to, to travel to this gathering, to a small church in Colossae 2,000 years ago, to be able to step back into their time and say, listen guys, I know it seems like this is just a small movement, but you need to know this has some staying power. This is going somewhere. One day it's going to be impossible to look at a map of the world and not notice the influence of Jesus Christ. This King Jesus that you are clinging to in your small town, in your congregation, his gospel is unstoppable. Regardless of the heavy, heavy opposition you are feeling and other believers are feeling. And think of the church. I mean, where before the church was there a movement that included everyone, regardless of race, gender, or politics? The, the calendars that, that, that you and I use are eternally stamped with the life of Jesus. Even books written by atheists have to be published with a date that proclaims the influence of Jesus Christ. In, in the ancient world, it was common for children who were weak and malformed or considered the wrong gender to be killed. But that began to change when Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Jesus and his followers welcomed and taught everyone, men, women, slaves, free. In the ancient world, nobody associated love with with Baal or, or Zeus, but Jesus brought a new way of thinking about God and love and grace and humility and the conviction that those revolutionary beliefs must have a say in how we live and see others. And this influence has not stopped. It has moved further than any, any other kingdom any earthly kingdom because it's an eternal kingdom. Martin Luther King's dream, Mother Teresa's humility, William Wilberforce's compassion, these are not secular movements, they were expressions of love that came from a faith based on a hope that the world cannot destroy, which is reserved in heaven for you. The boasts of ancient kings and emperors are in the dust. 
As one writer says it, and I, I love this, today we give our, children's na our children names like Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we give our dogs names like Caesar and Nero. If you belong to Christ, you are on the right side of history. It doesn't always feel like it, and that is why we are encouraged by Paul here, and we are encouraged over and over to nurture hope by continuing to visit the truth of the gospel. You know, in a few months, this, this garden behind me is gonna look very different. It will look devoid of life, but that's not the whole story. That's just the season, life is coming. Some of you right now are hurting, you're experiencing loss, you're walking through pain, depression, anxiety. That's not the whole story, that's just the season. Life is promised and life is coming. That's the promise of the gospel. May your faith be like that described by the Messiah elder, a faith that tackles, embraces, envelops the good news and promises of Jesus Christ for you. There is eternal sustaining hope found nowhere else. No one other than Jesus. And that makes sense that, that this hope is found in Jesus and nowhere else because as Paul goes on to write in this same chapter, no one can make the claims that Jesus can. No one has the credentials that Jesus has to make these claims. In Colossians, 1 verse 15, Paul paints this beautiful picture of who Jesus is. This is the truth we need to claim and understand. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Brothers, and sisters, church founded in the sustaining hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May the Lord of hope bless you and protect you. May the Lord of hope smile on you and be gracious to you. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you so much, Pastor Brad, for that very timely word. Such I'm very message. encouraged by that, yeah. Well, just to remind you, uh, we have some picnics coming up. There's one happening on Sunday. So some of you, for some of you, it's today yeah. happening right now. Uh, and also next week, we have a picnic coming up. And then we're gathering, as Andrew said earlier, we're gathering together yeah. physical locations starting later this month. There's going to be some discussion questions. I'd encourage you, if you're, if you're joining us online in the chat, spend some time over the next 15 yeah. minutes, discuss it together if you're in homes. We would love for you to take some time right now, pray with one another, discuss the questions, be the church with one another, and we'll see you again soon. Yeah, God, God bless. bless.
friends, in the past couple months, we have been given the opportunity to come alongside two of our families to, de to dedicate their children to the Lord. During COVID, we had found it to be tricky as we would normally gather on a weekend service and pray for them as a church family. During this time, we had done them in a small group with some close loved ones and to witness and pray for their little ones. Child dedications are moments where the parents publicly declare and dedicate their child to God. This isn't just about the child being dedicated, but about the parents bringing their child to the church to make a covenant with God to raise them in the way of Jesus, to know Him and love Him. The practice of dedication has its roots in Deuteronomy 6. So to parent a child is a great privilege and responsibility, but God doesn't intend for parents to do it alone. This is where we as a church are designed to function as a community of people who support each other spiritually and practically. We see this in Romans 12, three to eight. So this means praying for them, loving them, bring bringing over food, whatever that may be. A child dedication is an event that brings these two influential elements together. Parents bring their child before the church body and make a covenant with God to raise their child to know and love Jesus. During this time, we had Pastor Michelle dedicate Adeline with her parents Ryan and Amy, and I had the privilege to dedicate Emma with her parents Simon and Tiffany. As a church community, we recognize this commitment to pray for the child and the parents and commit to supporting them in the future. Even though COVID has not allowed us to dedicate these children publicly as we would normally, we encourage as a church to pray for these families as they teach and guide their children in the ways of Jesus. Thank you, church. Have a great rest of your week.